how organisms how organisms obtain energy and uh, nutrients because all organisms to grow and reproduce require um, energy and nutrients specifically let's think about carbon we live on a planet of carbon based life forms so we can just think about where do they get their, where do organisms get their carbon and where do they get their energy and I'll, um, I'll divide these into a few different trophic modes, feeding modes, um, now, because I'll start to use these terms. So we'll divide it between energy and carbon. Where do they get their energy? Where do they get their carbon? What we call a photoautotroph. And this is a convenient terminology, but your book may be slightly different. Photoautotrophs, like the plants you see growing outside, the, most of the plants you see growing outside when you walk out, get their energy from where? From the sun. Where do they get their carbon? From carbon dioxide. And that's your typical mode of photosynthesis for most of the plants outside of VLSD. But there are a bunch of other feeding types among the prokaryotes in particular, but also among eukaryotes. There are photoheterotrophs. They also get their energy from the sun, but they derive their carbon from previously synthesized organic compounds. So organic compounds that are generally made by other organisms, compounds. Photoheterotroph, photoautotroph, photo, light, auto, self, troph, food, nutriment, self-feeding with light. Hetero, other, uh, light and other feeding, light and the reliance on other organisms and their organic compounds, heterotrophy, photoheterotrophy. Chemo, autotrophs. These guys derive their energy from inorganic substances, like hydrogen sulfide that I talked about. So inorganic substances. And they get their carbon from carbon dioxide. A final category that we can use is hetero just simply heterotrophs. And this is where I simplify some others, other terminology um, in this context. But your heterotrophs get both their energy and carbon from um, previously synthesized organic compounds. And what's a good example of a heterotroph? Name one, name a good heterotroph. Humans, cats, pigs and many, many other creatures that eat other things. They're not busy making any of the food themselves through photosynthesis or based on um, the reliance on chemical energy. So I'll use the terms autotroph and heterotroph a lot and sometimes divide them into these specific modes. So there's an early eukaryote fossil. Certainly it's not at the very origin of the eukaryotes at 1.5 billion years. The origin of eukaryotes probably predates that, but that's one of the earliest best fossils. And as you heard about, um, the eukaryotes evolved in an, by hypothesis according to the endosymbiotic theory in a very interesting way. As a, as, a, as a network of prokaryotic interactions with an ancient eukaryotic cell, where in a primary phase, a once free living prokaryote was engulfed in some way inside of a eukaryotic cell that had a good nucleus, and those prokaryotes formed the energy factories, mitochondria, in these new cells. And all cells today with mitochondria herald that history of a, a once free living prokaryotic organism having joined that cell. It's a stunning hypothesis that Again, you would have been laughed at if you talked about it maybe 20 years ago. But now it's standard textbook fare that the origin of, uh, or the evolution of eukaryotic cells involved endosymbiosis like this. Even in secondary phases, a really complex pattern of symbiosis where in a later phase, a cell with mitochondria already engulfed another once free living prokaryote that formed the plastids, including the chloroplasts of plants. A prokaryote that was autotrophic, photoautotrophic, and continued to serve that role in the new cell by performing photosynthesis for that cell. So the cells in your body today, well, they don't include chloroplasts, but they include some of these other organelles that have an independent evolutionary history. And in that sense, by that definition, the cells in your body can be thought of even as communities, as interactive systems of different species or different kinds of things. It gives a whole new view of, um, of what cells are, what eukaryotic cells are, and the history of life. It's really fantastic. It was a Berkeley-affiliated uh, individual, Lynn Margulis, who championed much of this. There had been uh, precursors to it, and even as long as 100 years ago, notions like this, but the endosymbiotic theory has, uh, has really gotten a lot of attention in recent years. Now, we talked about stromatolites and biofilms. Today, a crust on a desert surface like this is a really sophisticated community that serves a major role, not only in the local ecosystem, but in global ecosystem dynamics. These crusts are complex communities of organisms, not only prokaryotes, but including eukaryotes. So what these investigators did, I'll get credits on this later, because it's really neat work. They looked at a little patch of a crust like this and added water. And when it receives a bit of moisture, these things reveal themselves more clearly as, uh, as cyanobacteria, as various quote unquote algae, as lichens and fungi and bryophytes, a really sophisticated crust of organisms that forms a layer that holds the soil in place in deserts, arid regions in particular, but in many, many areas of open land where, except, except for the extremely arid environments, like the Atacama Desert, where there's extremely arid environments, you have crusts that form over time of this nature that fix nitrogen from the atmosphere, that prevent the soil from drying and desiccating and blowing in the wind and, um, and moving around in the atmosphere um, and causing major changes in global dynamics. So when we ride on our ATVs on these systems or uh, what, party in the desert, um, you can destroy these complex ecosystems and sometimes irreparably. And this is a major concern on local and global scales, believe it or not, um, the breakdown of microbiotic crusts and the influence on global dynamics in ecology. We'll talk more about it later. But we, in that way, you know, that's what ecologists do. They can think on this micro scale and think to the global scale. Ecologists sometimes flatter themselves by saying it's the most complex science, ecology. And if, uh, if there's truth to that, it has to do with this moving across scales and moving across levels of organization. Um, that's the sense in which it's so complex. Microbiomes is a term that um, doctors are using more and more for something similar to what we saw with uh, the biofilms in the dental plaque. But your nose has its own microbiome, uh, your own community of organisms. The skin, um, 
the gastrointestinal tract, your genital system. You can do phylogenies of the communities involved in these different places and see the complexity of the communities that exist in these different areas on your body that you rely on for your health. Uh, these are not pathogens necessarily. When they get out of hand, when particular lineages of these organisms get out of hand, that's pathology. But in their normal functioning, they assist you in breathing, digesting, and keeping clean generally. When I put a red uh, information button like this, um, when you hover over it on your computer, it's a button, and the red ones mean uh, that's required reading. I'll also put a, I'll also put a link on BSpace to the required reading. I'll occasionally have a news item. This is a New York Times article on the subject. Many of you are pre-med and pre-dental, and it's a great thing to know about. So just when you see one of those, hit the button, and it'll take you to the to the source on the web for a, for a quick read. Usually not painful. Written by a journalist, scientific journalist, so usually pretty well written. Um, and if you hover over, many of these things are clickable. If you hover over this citation, then you can go to the original article. This original article. Just some of the lineages, just in the salivary microbiome, all the different lineages of prokaryotes in particular that can be found in the salivary microbiome. Outrageous. All that's really a new, new understanding. So take your, uh, your happy humans here and their microbiomes, and you can focus on, on them on that microscopic scale, or you can look at them as here and having a little picnic on a lawn on, next to Lake Michigan, and you can think about them as a local ecological system on different scales. And this is, people love this. People love these powers of 10 type videos. This is an old one from the 50s or 60s that was quite famous. Um, many, many people watch it. Your parents probably watched it at some point. And it's a way of embracing the whole universe on this spatial orders of magnitude. Um, concept. You know, so we go out to a thousand meters and we almost see the Great Lake, there's Chicago, and as we go out further and further, we eventually get to the whole planet, and then to the solar system, and then to our galaxy, and then out to the edges of the universe. That's fun. That's really fun. But I also think it can confuse our thinking about biological systems, a strict reliance on orders of magnitude, of spatial scale, in the way we arrange ecological systems. You can click it and watch it and listen to the fun music on your own time. There's another one here someone sent me. Um, this, is, this one's pretty sweet. Let me see if I click it. You can try it. It'll load for you. You can click around here, you know, so there's a human for scale, there's a giant earthworm. I've seen these things in Africa, they do get that long. Um, uh, actually, the, the biggest ones I believe are in, our, are in Australia, but Africa grows some big ones too. There's a really big plant called Replicia. There's the dodo bird. Or you can click in, you can zoom in here, see if it works for me. And, you know, there's a hummingbird versus a teapot. And you can get a sense of scale of different things in this way. Or you can zoom back out. And I urge you to play around and think, try to think when you do this, think metrically, think in inches. If, you're, if your first reaction is to think in um, inches and feet, do so, but start to translate it to metric. It's, it's quite unfortunate if you were raised thinking in feet and inches and want to be a scientist. I say it's flatly, and I am one of those types. I have to do a lot of translation in my head because I was raised, darn it, on each inches and feet because Jimmy Carter didn't pull it off and institute a metric system in this country. Um, he tried hard when I was a kid. But, um, so you need to click around and think about scale and also get a sense of what metric units mean in these contexts, and you can go in and uh, have a great time. But that is really important in thinking about ecology, is knowing your way around these different spatial scales. How does that relate to the levels of organization concept, which is standard textbook fare? You've all, got, you've all received it in your high school textbook, some idea of the levels of organization, that you have atoms that combine together to form molecules, molecules come together to form organelles, such as the plastids we looked at, that themselves are parts of cells that make up tissues of different cell types that comprise organs, which make up organisms. That works pretty well in a spatial sense. Atoms are smaller than molecules that they are part of, and those molecules are smarter, smaller than the organelles that they're part of, and, and onward. And it kind of works when you put your organisms in a population context. One organism is smaller than a population of organisms of the same kind. And those populations are stitched together as communities of different populations or species. Where it gets weird is in this concept, ecosystems. Are ecosystems bigger than communities on a, in a spatial sense? Well, we've just seen all these ecological systems that exist on micro scales that are ecological systems by virtue of the fact that they're interacting abiotic, biotic systems. So there's a confusion and a conflation in the old levels of organization concept and our spatial hierarchy of orders of magnitude that I want you to just think about at a philosophical level. Um, and we'll revisit it when we look at what is an ecosystem later in the lecture, this lecture series. And I'll give you on your slides a couple different textbook examples of the levels of organization concept. An individual, a population, I guess, it really just is a family of mice. A community, as soon as you throw in a sky and some water, you get an ecosystem. And this is a landscape or something because it's at a different spatial scale than this, it's a different perspective. And then you, you, know, you have the biosphere as your biggest. Start to think about levels of organization concepts, please. We'll talk about it as we go. So I said at the beginning of the lecture that natural history um, is still at the heart of much of the life sciences and ecology. It's a quaint phrase. And most respectable universities have dispensed with any teaching of specific teaching of natural history. Berkeley is fantastic in continuing to embrace this, uh, this part of biology, good old-fashioned natural history. We have courses in this department in natural history, where you spend a lot of time outside in the field getting to, wa getting to watch organisms, understand organisms in, a, in an experiential sense. You watch them, you listen to them, you, you look for them, and, and that's natural history in biology. But natural history is broader than that. You can do a natural history of the bay that just looks at the tides or looks at the influence of climate on the temperature of the bay. You can work in a strictly physical context and be doing natural history. It doesn't have to involve organisms, just involve the study of nature. But in our context, you know, it's the study of uh, copepods or sharks or great blue herons in the bay would be natural history. It's particularly a phrase that's used to describe non-scientific types of observation that don't rely on quantification, but more on qualitative observation. Going out and watching, maybe writing about it, even uh, writing about it poetically. Um, you can be a good naturalist or natural historian and really not be doing science. But the best scientists are natural historians at heart because those natural historians know how to observe, they know how to patiently observe, they know how to record and document what they see and experience clearly, and that can be translated into, into good data. So when did human beings start doing this and become such good observers of nature. Well, think about it. If you don't observe nature and know the creatures around you, um, it's, it could very well be a hit on your own survival opportunity. 
it behooves you to know other organisms and how they move and what they want in terms of their food feeding relationships. And I'm thinking on a vertebrate scale here of big mammals interacting with humans in particular, uh, if you're going to avoid dying and being able to find food yourself in, in an evolutionary context. And this is true for other organisms. Someone sent me a video of two gorillas in a zoo watching a caterpillar yesterday. You know, it's one of these 13 second things that uh, you do while you're drinking your coffee. And these gorillas are fascinated by this caterpillar. They're walking on the bars of its cage in the zoo. And they're just watching it really closely. No, they're not writing uh, paragraphs about their observations. They're not documenting their observations at all, except in, some, in any, whatever type of memory they have. But people began to document their observations at some point in history. We do that well with pen and pencil today. But here, 32,000 years ago, Kilo and I, at a place like Chauvet Cave in southern France, and this was only discovered in the 90s, some cave uh, searchers found this spectacular cave that had been overlooked all these centuries. When they went inside and opened it up, they found huge galleries of artwork on the walls that represented from 32,000 years ago. Um, and there are older caves still with such art, not nearly as complex uh, in these other caves that have been found. Beautiful renderings of the organisms they lived with. These equids, these horse-like animals on the panel here. Big panels like this now, there's no scale that a human being would stand maybe this tall. Rhinoceroses, cats behind them, proboscideans, elephants, mammoths, some kind of big bobbin here, cow-like thing. What are those? What do you think those are? They're, what? Well, if those are bears, then what's that? <laughs> those are lions. And for the depictions are so incredible. I mean, the, the, the expressions, the you know, capture so much in these depictions. These artists were so good and their observations so keen that biologists can learn things about the biology of these lions from their depictions. For example, the males in these depictions tend not to have manes. We know they're males because they have testicles on the back, but they don't have a fuzzy mane. So maybe these cave lions of Europe didn't have manes. The, the males are often involved in the hunts. As you know today, the males often sit out the hunt. You can learn about the biology of these organisms from these depictions. And then, yeah, it's a bear. Go bears. See you guys.